I can't wait to talk to Habakkuk or Habakkuk or whatever his name is because uh, he has messed me up over these last six weeks. I'll tell you, we're in our sixth week of the book of Habakkuk. So take your Bibles, if you would, and go to the minor prophet of Habakkuk, our last week in Habakkuk. Go to Matthew, take a left. Malachi, I think four books back, you're going to find uh, Habakkuk. It's a book that I tell you, the Lord's been stirring in, in my heart. This is our sixth week, and we now come to the third chapter of Habakkuk. Let me say good morning. Good morning. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving as family came in. What a blessing. And as family leave, what a blessing. I'm just kidding. Yeah, happy Thanksgiving. So our schedule, we went to my uh, wife's family for lunch on Thanksgiving. So we did Thanksgiving lunch there. And then we went home and kind of had the evening to ourselves because my mom, we do Thanksgiving at my family on Friday night because my brother's family uh, wife is all from the Eastern Shore. And so they go over there for Thanksgiving. And then we come back Friday at my parents. And so Thursday night, we were at Wawa, because that's my favorite place in the world, and I was at Wawa, and Tristan was with me, and there was a lady in the store, and she said, hey, young man, how was your Thanksgiving? And he said, it was great. She said, well, what did you have for dinner? And he said, a corn dog. <laughs> and she looked at me like I have failed this child. Like, you fed him a corn dog on Thanksgiving? I'm like, it's a great Thanksgiving. He had a corn dog on Thanksgiving. And yes, he did. It's a, it's a tradition of ours. He, I'm just kidding. He just loves corn dogs. So he had corn dog on Thanksgiving. Where are we at? Habakkuk chapter 3. Hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Next week, we're going to begin our Christmas series. And you know, my prayer through this is that you see the thread, right? I think that's one of the things that has stirred me the most is to see this book 600 years ago, right? 600 years before Christ in a setting that was chaotic, you know, in a, in a setting similar to like when we look at the world and you see evil and injustice and you think to yourself, how can God be here, right? I mean, that's how the book begins. The book begins with a burden. If you got your Bibles, go there. We'll do a quick kind of recap of chapter one. I mean, it's an interesting book because here's a minor prophet, a, a prophet of God, not speaking to the people, but speaking directly to God. He has a back and forth conversation with God. It's so interesting that here he is beginning in the first four verses, even questioning if God even hears him. Have you ever been there? I got a burden on me, Lord. I'm crying out, are you there? Have you ever been there? Uh, God, I don't hear your voice. I'm even doubting your presence. That's the way the book begins. And so what I want you to see, I know how the Lord's used it in my heart, is the progression of Habakkuk. To watch how the Lord moved him in answering his questions. He wanted answers. The Lord gave him answers. And it wasn't the things that he was thinking would be the answers. But God was sovereign through it all. I'm going to invite you to stand with me in reverence to reading God's word. Habakkuk chapter 3. The title of the message this morning, Yet... Yet, yet, yet. There's some of you here this morning that need to claim, yet, I will, say it with me. All right, we're going to try it again. Some of you have a burden and you walked in here. Yet, I will, because my joy is in the God of my salvation. That's what we're going to see through this, that here's a man that God moved him to a place where he said, you know what, God, if everything is taken, if nothing is left and all I have is you, I got joy. That's what he proclaimed. The worst case scenario as long as I have the Lord, I'm okay. Look at what he says here. Look at the proclamation here. This is this, I love this. Chapter three is really the prayer of Habakkuk. It's him proclaiming what God has done in his life. And as you come to the end, I love this, verse 17, 18, and 19. We've read this each week, and it's the proclamation of where God brings this man. It says this, so the fig tree, I think I have it on the screen somewhere. Though the fig tree... Yeah, be. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the field yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold. So let's explain what he's saying. If everything is taken, you get it? If nothing is left, here comes the Babylonians, they're coming in, they're taking over, they're killing everything, they're destroying everything. He says, if nothing is left, man, can we say this? I don't know that I could. Verse 18, yet, yet. I will rejoice in the Lord. Hear the rain for a moment and just pause. Be still and know what? So let's just be still for a moment. He makes a decision. And all this here, yet, I will rejoice because this don't move. This may move. This don't move. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my, say it with me. When we are weak, he is, 
Man, we need that this morning. He will make my feet like deer's feet. He will make me to walk in high heels to the chief. Just kidding. I will say that for the rest of my life. <laughs> he will make me walk on my high heels. Join with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father. Lord, what a promise you have given us in your word this morning. And so, Lord, this morning we pray because we believe that what we have in front of us is alive, that it's active, that it cuts deep. And so, Lord, this morning we are praying for your Holy Spirit to take your word and penetrate our hearts and lives, that this would not just be a day that we show up for church and do our thing and then go home. Lord, we pray with great anticipation the work that you want to do in our lives. And there are many in this place, like Habakkuk, that walked in with a burden, and if, had to, if they had to be completely honest, they are consumed by it. And it's hard for them to see you through it. And so, Lord, this morning, may we flip the filter and look through the lens of truth this morning, of who you are and who we are in you. When we can't see your hands, we can trust your heart. And so, Lord, this morning, we trust that. May we be found faithful even in the midst of our questions. We pray it, we ask it, and all God's people said, amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm stirred. Y'all all right? Here we go. It's just Habakkuk, man. I got got a lot to say to Habakkuk when we get to heaven. I mean, it's, it's such an interesting book to me because here is this guy just having this back and forth with God. And and basically saying, okay, I don't get this, I don't like this, but again, the thing that we see all throughout the book is a man that runs to God. I think more than anything that has challenged me through this is a man that runs to God, that his go-to move is God, that his go-to move is not flesh, that his go-to move is not sin, that his go-to move is not some numbing agent, that his go-to move is God. Don't miss that. In his anger, in his frustration, in his disappointment, you find a man that is consistently what? Moving to the Lord. James says what? Draw near to God and he will. I believe that, that if you're a child of God, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the enemy has no authority. That in the power of the resurrection, when a child of God initiates their walk with the Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the resurrection, there ain't nothing the enemy can do to stop that. So what does he do? He keeps us from We get up here in our little corners, we're consumed, we're disappointed, and rather than looking through the lens of God's word and seeking the Lord, running to the Lord, we run to our stuff. And here's a man that consistently runs to the Lord, I don't like this, I don't get this, but I'm coming to you. Lord, I don't understand this, how are you in this, but I'm coming to you. Don't miss that. In six weeks of this study, don't miss a man that brings his questions to the Lord. A child that comes into the room and says, Father, I don't understand, but I'm going to stay here in your presence and just be with you. And it's such a picture of that. Look at his prayer in verse 2, the prayer of Habakkuk. We looked at this last week. Oh, Lord, I have heard your speech, your report, and I was afraid. My body trembled. What is the report? The report of the Babylonians coming in to take over. And we see how God has moved this man to this place. Look at his prayer. Oh, Lord, revive your work. We talked about this last week. Rather than praying for removal, praying for deliverance, he prays for revival. You want to see depth here? Not God, remove this from my life. That's not what he prays. God, change me through this in my life. Revive your work, right? That's a different filter, To wake up in the morning and not look at your struggles as, oh man, this is keeping me from the Lord, but to look at it as, no, the Lord has led me to this place and the Lord wants to lead me through this place. Habakkuk proclaims that. Make your name known. Have mercy in your judgment. And we talked about the abundant mercy of God last week. It all is pointing to Jesus. Look at verse three. God came from Timon, the holy one, from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. And so now Habakkuk just breaks out in praise, right? He begins to just proclaim the attributes of God. Verse 3, and the Holy One from Mount Pal. Selah basically is a pause in the music, or, or it's an affirmation. It's almost like amen, or verily. Look at the next part of verse 3. His glory covered the heavens. He is speaking now of the splendor of God. His glory reigning over all creation for all time. It's interesting the language that Habakkuk uses here. It's very familiar to the language of when God made the covenant with Moses. Take your Bibles, or you can write this. I have it down. Deuteronomy uh, chapter 33. And look at these words in just verse 1 and 2. Listen to how similar these words are to the words of Habakkuk, right? 
And that's what you're going to see is Habakkuk is going to proclaim what God has already done. The deliverance of his people from the past, now proclaiming deliverance for the future. That's what he does here. But look at what it says in Deuteronomy. Now, this is the blessing with Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. Verse 2, and he said, the Lord came from Sinai. Did I say that right? And dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. From his right hand came a fury law for them. Habakkuk uses this language to now praise who God is in the midst of chaos. In the eye of the storm, what you find this man doing is proclaiming who God is. Look at, look at, look at verse 4. His brightness was like the light. He had rays flashing from his hand, and there his power was hidden. Remember when Moses came down with the law, the Bible says that his face shone because he was in the presence of the Lord. Look at verse 5. He now speaks of the plagues of Egypt. Again, past deliverance. Before him was pestilence, and fever followed at his feet. He is speaking again of a God who saves. Look at verse 6 and 7. He stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove us under the nation, and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. You see something here, right? You see a reference to history, but also a reference to prophecy. This is such an interesting thing, the word timon. Go back to verse 3. It's interesting because many theologians will look at this as a word that means two different things. Some will say, well, this is a physical place east of Jerusalem, Timon, south of Edom. They'll say that. But then they'll also say this, that it's also a person. Timon was the grandson of Esau. Follow this for a second. Esau was the father of the Edomites. The Hebrew word for Edom is Adam. So what this passage says in that Hebrew context is that God came from You see it? Adam. Man. Genesis 3.15, right? Of the seed of a, that God would become man. We see Jesus right here. Look at verse 8 and 9. O Lord, were you displeased with the rivers? Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses, your chariots of salvation? Your bow was made quite ready. Oats were sworn over your arrows. Selah, you divided the earth with rivers. You see this picture of Habakkuk proclaiming God, that here is God leading his people. Here is God protecting his people. Again, he knows that the Babylonians are coming, but he's proclaiming what God has already done, and he's proclaiming what God has promised to do. Hear that in our lives. In the present moment, right, to be able to go back and go, man, God has been faithful. He has been faithful. He has been faithful. He has never let me down. And to come back to where you are in your struggle, in your chaos, and to match those two things up. And to say, okay, I know what he's done, but I'm anticipating what he's going to do. I don't want to miss that. You see Habakkuk proclaiming the past, but really prophesying to the future. The first of his wonderful works recounted by Habakkuk is the passage through the Red Sea. You see that in verse 8 and 9 where he represents the Lord as appearing at the head of the Israelites in his chariot of war, his bow drawn in his hand to rescue them from the oppressors. It's this picture that God has delivered us already. Once again, he's going to deliver us. Look at verse 10. The mountain saw you and trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered its voice and lifted its hands on high. Verse 11. The sun and the moon stood still. In their habitation. When did that happen? Do you remember? Sun and the moon stood still. First time, Joshua 11. We see that in the conquest of Canaan. Where, when does it happen again? Do you know? When does it happen again? Jesus where? On the cross. Look at verse 12. There must be judgment for sin. Habakkuk acknowledges that, that this is a promise-keeping God. But God wasn't finished. After he came and conquered, he continued to march victoriously. Look at verse 12. You marched through the land in indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. You went forth for the salvation of your people. Verse 13. You went forth for the salvation of your people. Just listen to that. For salvation with your anointed, next phrase, you struck the head from the house of the wicked. Do you see it? You struck the head from, what what kind of language is that? Do you remember the Garden of Eden? Right? The Garden of Eden, God steps in and sin enters into humanity. Satan thought he had won. God right there proclaims victory. Rather than casting judgment upon Adam and Eve right away, what does he do? He casts mercy. He says, you're not one. There's going to be enmity between you and man. 
and out of the seed of a woman, what does he say? He will crush your head, bruise his heel, but crush the head of the enemy. Look at what he says at the end of verse 13. You struck the head, Jesus, from the house of the wicked by laying bare from foundation to next Selah. You thrust through his own ears. I'm about to sing. I'm about to sing. The head of his villages, they came out like a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was like feasting on the poor in secret. You walked through the sea with your horses through the heap of your great waters. It's a direct reference, I believe. Seed of the woman crushing the head of the enemy. All right, we're going to finish this up. He's now ready to make his statement of faith. Look at verse 16. When I heard my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered into my bones and I trembled in myself. Don't miss this phrase, don't miss this phrase, that I might rest in the day of trouble. That I might rest in the day of trouble. You hear me? There's some of you in the storm this morning that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. Through it all, Habakkuk says this, God, you have brought me to a place that I don't understand. I acknowledge that. I'm not going to. But I trust you. And not only do I trust you, I'm gonna proclaim the truth of who you are every step that I take. Look at what he says in verse 17. This has hit me between the eyes for six weeks. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the field yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stall. It's interesting here, right? The fig tree is a symbol of security and hope, and it was used to depict the entire nation of Israel. So look at what he says there with that phrase, though the fig tree may not blossom, though your people may not blossom. Worst case scenario, no fruit on the vines, labor may fail, fields yield no food, flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. You have taken everything, God. And yet, I will rejoice. For six weeks, the Lord has asked me that question. If I took everything, your family, your ministry, everything that you had. Could you say, yet, I rejoice? And he connects it, right, because the joy is in the God of my salvation. I mean, he connects it right away, that the joy is in a place that can't be moved, it can't be touched, regardless of what my life does. My joy is there because my joy is in Jesus, and unless Jesus changes, that ain't going to move. So my joy is secure, my joy is stable. As long as I'm walking in that joy, I can be in chaos and I can be in the storms, but I'm looking at it through the filter of joy because God's led me there. And he's in it with me, he's in the fire with me. He's not gonna fail, let me just look back. That's what he does, let me just look back. Let me just remember the work of God in my life up until this point. Let me just do that for all of us, right? To be able to see how God has taken us. He found us broken, lost, and he saved us, and he redeemed us, and he secured us, and he says, listen, I want to go with you. How could we not have joy in that journey? Amen? We're not in it alone. This ain't a religion. This is a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Habakkuk is crying out for that, Habakkuk is saying, God, I get it. I get it. There must be judgment. You are a promise-keeping God. You would cease to be God if you didn't keep one of your promises. Habakkuk says, I get it. And yet I still rejoice. I don't understand it. And yet I will rejoice. There's a decision. It's being intentional, right? This doesn't happen naturally. I don't wake up in the morning and naturally just seek the Lord. It just doesn't go that way. My flesh goes the other way. If you can identify with that, say amen. You just lied if you didn't, so you can't identify with that. So when the Lord, what? what we, we, I am crucified with Christ, right? What must I do? I must die to self. The greatest enemy I have is myself. I must die to my pride, my agenda, all of those things and say, you know what, my, fu- my fulfillment, my value, my purpose is not found in any of those things. My fulfillment, my value, my purpose is found in the fact that God died for me. 
And because he died for me, there is joy. And my day, you can't touch this. You can't touch this. I feel like MC Hammer. You can't touch my joy. Because my joy is secure. And Habakkuk proclaims, God, take it all. I'll still rejoice. I'll still rejoice. I'll stand there with nothing in my hands and still rejoice. Because I know that I'm going to heaven. I know that I have a home and this place is not it. I am passing through. Can I get an amen? Habakkuk says, listen, may there be mercy. He's pointing to Jesus. He's asking for Jesus 600 years before the birth of Christ. It's almost as if the father is saying, hold on, hold on. He's coming. He's coming. And as we see next week, man, it all connects. Back at the Garden of Eden, God made a promise that your greatest problem and my greatest problem is one and the same. We're sinners. And you can't deny it. And because of our sins, we stand guilty before a holy God. That's our dilemma, every one of us. We stand before perfection and righteousness, guilty. I know I am. So there's a problem there, right? And the Bible says there's nothing you can do. There's no ceremony. There's no works. Why? Because we can boast in those things. We can say, look at what I did to get to God. Look at what I did. To no, he says, no, no, no. By faith, you surrender and you die to self. You turn from your sins and you profess a Savior, Jesus. And Habakkuk says, because my joy is in that, I'm secure. Look at what he says here. He ends this. I love what he says about the strength of the Lord. Let's just finish up right here. Look at verse 19, just that very, first, that very first line. The Lord God is my, say it with me, the Lord God is my, some of you need to say that this morning, the Lord God is my, say it with me, proclaim it, because you are weak, he is strong. The Lord God is my, we got to walk in that. The enemy wants you and me to think that we're fighting for a battle. Listen, the battle's been won, the victory's been declared, the grave is empty. We're not fighting for the battle. We're walking in victory. But the enemy does not want us to know that. And so what must we do? We must be intentional. I wake up, yet I will rejoice. My mind goes to the Lord. I rejoice in the joy of my salvation. Lord, before I do anything else, put my heart and mind in the place where it needs to go. There at the cross, you died for me. My life was given by Christ. So I want to live with you, Lord. I want to walk with you. I want to go before you. And even if, I will rejoice. Could we say that this morning? That right now, if you stood before God and he took everything, would we still trust him? Would we still rejoice? With every head bowed and every eye closed. For by grace you are saved through faith. Listen, all this comes back to that. Everything that we're talking about comes back to faith. The Bible says we're saved by faith. The Bible says we walk by faith. That every day in the life of a believer is a, is, is a challenge of faith every day. Listen, if you're here this morning, you've never professed faith in Christ, then that's the beginning of all of this. It's acknowledging, recognizing your sins, your guilt, turning from that and proclaiming Jesus as Savior. Listen, there's no magic words here. It's just simply a heart that recognizes I'm in need of a Savior because I'm a sinner. Let's let's simplify this. And by faith, because I can't see him, I profess Jesus. Not a religion, a person. A real person, God, who came and lived in flesh and bones. Just like this. For one purpose, to die. That's why he came, to die. To think about the fact that the only truly innocent person ever, Jesus, no sin, died for the guilty. And so Habakkuk recognizes this. The bottom line is there has to be judgment for sin. God would cease to be God if there wasn't. I'm just be real with you. What it comes down to is you stand before God, either covered in the righteousness of Christ, or you stand exposed in your sins. There's really no other place. I said it before, I'll say it again. I shudder to think. I know my mistakes. I know my past. 
And there's joy in the fact that there's covering in that and redemption in that, forgiveness in that. So if you're here this morning and you've never professed faith in Jesus, man, this is a heart before God. That's all this is. This is you and the Lord. An acknowledgement of sin and a profession of faith. As believers, man, six weeks of Habakkuk, we see the realness in our lives. God, I know what it says about who you are, and I know what it says about what you can do, but I don't see it here. I don't feel you. Are you there? Can you hear me? And we can relate to this. And he brings the man to a place where he just says, Lord, I trust you. Reckless abandonment, I trust you. And I lay it all on the line. There's no ifs. If I need to be reminded, may I see the empty tomb. I need to be reminded of your heart and the chaos of my life. May I see an empty tomb. I invite you to stand as we go to the Lord in prayer. We've got our spiritual response team, our pastors, man. It's a journey. I'm on it with you. And there's their struggles in that. We need each other. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning acknowledging that we are weak. We acknowledge that we are weak. But we profess that you are strong. You are mighty. And you are sitting on your throne this morning. We know that. And so, Lord, in the details of our lives, may we see you. May we seek you. May there be rest in chaos. Rest in pain, rest in struggle. May there be joy, because it's in Jesus. So Lord, this morning, do the work that only you can in the hearts and lives of your people. We proclaim the name of Jesus. We lift it high. And it's in that name we pray, and all God's people said,